Welcome to the Green Nurse Podcast, clinical conversations at high noon, where we bring hope and inspiration for growth and healing. We are here to change the dialogue and stigma around what it means to feel good or be high. Hence the H for hope, I for inspiration, G for growth, and H for healing. My name is Sherry Mack, and I'm the Vice President of Nursing and Holistic Caring in the Green Nurse. I'm a cannabis nurse, patient, advocate, activist, and a very passionate podcaster here to change the paradigm of healthcare. Before we get started, here is a little bit about what we do in the cannabis space as nurses, and then we're going to dig right into our very powerful clinical conversation today. The paradigm of healthcare. The Green Nurse is a holistic cannabis nurse that teaches on the endocannabinoid system and the safe utilization of cannabis and other progressive tools to help people reach a better quality of life. I'm the founder of Holistic Caring. We're based here in California and we do educational programs and case management for patients on how to use cannabis therapeutically as a medicine. We're also here to decrease stigma around what it means to feel good and be high, hence the H for hope, I for inspiration, G for growth, and H for healing. As the founder of Holistic Caring, I basically over, oversee the, the whole ship. And what we're doing is uh, progressive education. Cannabis actually supports all 11 organ systems, our immune system, and all the neurotransmitter signaling systems that give messages to tell our body to either do something or not do something. Because the plant was prohibited, it prevented health professionals, doctors, and nurses from learning about cannabis as medicine. I want to change the paradigm of healthcare and us paving the way into a new vanguard of medicine. It's about education, it's about empowerment, it's about teaching people how to feel good, bridging the gap from what they're not getting from traditional medicine, utilizing different plant medicines, adaptogens, tips, tricks, hugs, and nugs of information to support and nourish the most important system in our body. And it's a lot of soul work, a lot of love, a lot of discipline, and meditation. I'm using my life work as a testimony to others to learn how they can be their own hero and then go help heal the world. And we are, as nurses, the game changers. go growing in health growing in cannabis i had to wait till that cannabis gets in there because it is so so important right so before we get started again on today's clinical webinar concepts in cannabis and anesthesiology with dr daniel king nurse elizabeth has a message from one of our sponsors nurse elizabeth tell us about bloom well so today's show is brought to you by bloom hemp and Bloom Hemp is a woman and nurse owned national CBD hemp supplier, uh, leading with quality, safety, value, and patient centered care. Bloom Hemp products are USDA organic CBD grown in the mountains of Colorado, third party tested for purity, potency, cannabinoid, and terpene profiles. And Bloom Hemp is proud to offer a free nurse line, and you can call 970 404 HOPE. Or 4673 to answer your basic questions about CBD and these products and how they might work best for you. So call today. There we go. Thank you, Bloom Hemp, for sponsoring our shows. We love that. And, you know, we're going to get started now. So we get questions all the time on cannabis, surgery, anesthesia, and who better to bring on the show but a nurse anesthesiologist who presented a keynote presentation at the American Cannabis Nurses Association national conference on this very topic, Cannabis Concepts in Anesthesiology. Dr. Daniel King is a board certified registered nurse anesthetist, also known as a CRNA, owner of Dream Lion Anesthesia and a professor at the Rosalind Franklin University of Medicine and Science in Chicago. Related to his research interests, Dr. King has disseminated several natural national presentations and scholarly works related to cannabis implications for patients undergoing anesthesia with special interests also in the social stigmatization of cannabis and healthcare. 
His leadership roles in the field of anesthesiology include multiple prior elected and appointed positions and previous service as chief nurse anesthetist for Steward Medical Group. Currently, he is chair of professional practice at the American Association of Nurse Anesthesiology, and he is a certified professional in patient safety, which means he can tell people what to do. <laughs> so Dream Lion Anesthesia is Dr. King's independent anesthesia contract contracting business, providing full scope anesthesia services in the greater Chicago region and consulting and educational services. Welcome, Daniel. We're so grateful to have you very back on presenting your keynote presentation. Welcome. Thanks so much, uh, Nurse Sherry and Nurse Elizabeth. It is so great to be here with uh, Green Nurse and Holistic Caring. I am so excited to partner with you. Um, and we need these collaborative partnerships in order to provide the best patient care. We have experts in cannabis care and we have experts in the field of anesthesiology. And it's rare that the two cross over. So um, forging those uh, partnerships and networking together has been wonderful. It's awesome to be back. Um, and yes, I tell people what to do, but I always try to do it from the lens of evidence-based practice. So what I hope to deliver today is some evidence-based information, and none of it is a perfect science, but we're working together on getting there and taking quality patient care, uh, or taking good quality uh, care of our patients, rather. Um, and, you know, we're in, that, we're in that mission together and also decreasing stigmatization. And we're going to talk about those things today. Here are some of our learning objectives for today. I really wanna start out by implementing a comprehensive cannabis assessment. What does that mean to have an honest, uh, you know, compassionate conversation in the preoperative period so that we can best identify really use patterns uh, and stratify risk and inform our perianesthesia plan of care. We can't provide care for what we don't know. And there's a lot of conversations that aren't happening in the preoperative care and I'm going to talk a lot about that today. I'm then going to move into explaining the pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics of our anesthetic drugs in the endocannabinoid system. A lot of people take for granted um, how vast the endocannabinoid system is and how our anesthetic drugs interact within that system uh, and with the cannabis itself. And then finally, we're going to move into really understanding current, but also considering future anesthetic implications for patients who use cannabis. And before we get there, I just want to acknowledge that there are many benefits of cannabinoid-based therapies. Now, as we speak about the dangers and mitigating risk, I, I want to acknowledge that that's what we're really in the business of in terms of anesthesia. So I just want to take a second to acknowledge um, that we are, are, are considering also the many uh, therapeutic benefits of cannabis and not just the risks, but this lecture will present major concerns relating to safely conducting an optimal anesthetic for patients who use cannabis with the currently available best evidence. And of course, there's a lot of work to do in the field of gathering evidence and a lot that relates to um, restrictions surrounding uh, being able to conduct that research because of its uh, Schedule One classification. We acknowledge that anesthesia is a real vulnerable time period for our patients, and we're not so great always at differentiating the pertinent details like dose, concentration, route, patterns of use, even reasons for use. And, and so we tend to lump it all together. And we'll do that a lot actually throughout this lecture. We'll talk about cannabis as a generality, um, but I also want to acknowledge that we should also be working to stratify those differentiators. So moving into the preoperative period, and we're just going to run this perioperatively from start to finish and talk about what we should be concerned about in the preoperative period. We know that there is lacking reported um, incidents of cannabis use and our patients are being under identified. I found this out through one of my own studies, actually. Your slides? Yes. They're not up. Hmm. Let me, um, let's, 
I add them to the stage, let's see. We try that now. How's that going? There we go. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, we acknowledge that um, the incidence of cannabis use is severely underreported in the preoperative uh, realm. And I identified this through one of my own studies that's cited here at the bottom of the slide in 2021. And looking at anesthesia for patients who self-report cannabis before esophagogastroduodenoscopy or EGD studies. And this was a retrospective review of 635 patients undergoing EGD uh, in a Massachusetts community hospital. And what was concerning to me is that despite state prevalent data um, demonstrating that about 21% of patients uh, were using cannabis within a recent 30 day period, only 7% or so patients were self-reporting cannabis use despite that prevalent data. And so what that meant to me was we're not so good at assessing for it uh, in the healthcare arena, but potentially also patients were not comfortable disclosing that. I feel that was probably largely related to stigmatization. And in 1963, Canadian American sociologist, uh, Dr. Irvin Goffman denoted the term stigma as having Greek origins. And what it meant was reference to bodily signs designed to expose something unusual and bad about the moral status of the signifier. And from this framework, there are four stigma domains that have emerged that we felt were most pertinent to cannabis use stigmatization. And when I say we, I mean, I mean my co-researchers as well, Dr. Carrie Clark, Dr. Christopher Gill, and Niha Singh. And we sought out to uh, conduct a national study of these very four stigma domains. We wanted to look at perceived stigma. Perceive, perceived stigma involves an individual's cognizance and perception of negative attitudes, concepts, or societal beliefs about cannabis. And we know there's heightened awareness of the cannabis using patient about perceived evaluation, discrimination, or labeling that can occur in the healthcare system. The second domain we wanted to look at was enacted stigma, that which is actually experienced uh, by the cannabis using patient. And it refers to those overt actions that are actually demonstrating discrimination or devaluating uh, a behavior. Cannabis users, we know, are more likely to be readily dismissed in the healthcare setting, even denied services, have their appointments cut shorter, or have poor outcomes when compared to non-users. Thirdly, we want to look at this idea of internalized stigma. Stereotypes about cannabis use that have become internalized, accepted, and embedded in the patient. Cannabis users experiencing internalized stigma are describing fears of being observed, changing behaviors about their use around others, and even hiding their use to conform to the believed expectation of others. And perhaps what is most significant that we found in this study is related to this domain of anticipated stigma referring to the specific beliefs about expected events, scenarios, or situations to unfold in the future that are based around stigmatization. And in our study, as I, as I show you the results, we'll see that this category was the most significant for cannabis using patients. They worry excessively about being devalued by healthcare providers if, they, if we would somehow know about their cannabis use. We know that patients who experience stigma have worse physical and mental health outcomes. And in the realm of anticipated stigma, they're worried that we won't listen to their concerns, that we'll think they're even prescription seeking or give them poor care, that we'll think they can't be trusted, look down on them, or we'll treat them differently. So we collected a randomized sample through a web-based survey of cannabis users in the United States. We sent an electronic survey link uh, using uh, organizations that we're very appreciative to, like Leaf411, TheAnswerPage.com, Holistic Caring as one of them, and the American Cannabis Nurses Association as primary survey distributors. Now, we were able to enroll 249 patients who met our inclusion criteria, which were age greater than 21, corresponding with the legal age of cannabis use for recreational purposes in most states, and reporting cannabis use and accessing the healthcare system within a recent five-year period. 
Here are the demographics related to uh, our patients enrolled in our study. As you can see, the mean age was about 50 years old. Most of our patients were female and most of them were white. In addition, most of our uh, participants reported earning a bachelor's degree or higher, so they were pretty well educated. The majority were married and there was actually diversity in household income that was reported. So most participants reported earning an average household income of more than $105,000 per year, yet the second most reported earning group was fewer than $35,000 annually. Interestingly, most of our participants reported residents in a U.S. state where cannabis is fully legal for medicinal and recreational purposes. Leading the way were California and Colorado being most frequently reported in our study. Now, this is important because prior research has informed us that legalization of cannabis is strongly correlated with decreased stigma experiences. Our use characteristics for patients were about as expected. So most participants reported smoking or vaping cannabis, which from an airway management standpoint on the side of anesthesia care is really concerning. Now there was an other category which included dry herb and concentrate dabbing in about eight participants. Surprisingly to me, most reported not knowing the amount of THC and CBD in their cannabis products. And it's surprising because it's a little bit different from what I actually encounter in the preoperative clinical setting. My patients often don't know when I ask them how much THC or CBD, or if they know the differing ratios in their products, uh, and definitively providers may not differentiate that in their assessment either. But it tells me that our surveyed population may be fairly educated about their cannabis products. The most frequently recorded average daily dose of CBD was somewhere between five and 20 milligrams in over half of the patients. And the most common range of THC dose was much more widely variable from one to more than 30 milligrams per day. Now cannabis use was reported to occur on most, meaning 21 or greater days of the month for 71% of our participants. And notably a third of them reported can using cannabis more than three times per day the most significant portion of those, or 48.4%, had been using cannabis for over 10 years. Now, why is that interesting or meaningful? Because again, prior research informs us, and it's highly suggestive that chronicity and frequency of use are strongly correlated with decreased stigma experiences and perhaps increased comfortability with having that conversation in the healthcare setting. When we asked our patients, how often do you make your cannabis use known to your healthcare provider? Uh, only 46% said that they always do. 32% said sometimes, and almost a quarter of them never make their cannabis use known to their healthcare provider. Also concerning and embarrassing to me as a healthcare provider is that the patient is the one initiating that conversation over half the time, 57% of the time, the patient is the one initiating that conversation. The healthcare provider only initiates that conversation about 15% of the time. So that I find that again, to be sorely disappointing uh, and an area for market improvement uh, among healthcare providers. No one is having the conversation almost 30% of the time. Now I found this to be extremely impactful. We specifically asked our participants, what most influences your desire to disclose your cannabis use? And comfortability with the healthcare provider was the leading answer, indicating that we need to be more empathy driven in our assessment and our approach to assessing patients who potentially use cannabis. To measure the stigmatization component, we used prior validated scales. We adapted them with express permission by the developers of the substance use stigma mechanism scale and the substance abuse self stigma scale, which collectively capture all four of those domains that I was talking to you about, internalized, perceived, enacted, and anticipated stigma. We then used ordinal logistic regression models that we adjusted for covariates to evaluate the associations between the frequency of disclosure patterns and each stigma category. 
we use a regression analysis to determine associations between the frequency of disclosure, meaning always, sometimes, or never disclosing cannabis use, with their demographics, as well as their cannabis use and disclosure patterns and stigma scores. So we drew a lot of significant correlations here. We looked at the interaction effects as well to assess the interaction between any stigma type and its dis association or uh, with disclosure patterns or the, just the likelihood that someone's gonna uh, disclose their cannabis use potentially in the preoperative setting. And of course, a p-value of less than 0.05 was considered statistically significant. Now, each stigma domain surveyed contained six Likert style questions for a possible score of 30 for that domain. And nothing is particularly diagnostic, but what we will say is that higher scores indicate greater stigmatization experiences. So it's all quantifiable. Now, anticipated stigma, as you can see, was the highest scored of all four categories. As you can see, it has a mean of 14.8, and notably, this was de deemed to be statistically significant. Not only in that, patients are having intense worry or persistent fear that when they enter my operating room, that if they disclose their cannabis use, they'll be treated differently, but also statistical significance as a predictor for non-disclosure of their cannabis use when I interview them in the pre-op holding area. As you can see, enacted scores were similar as for perceived stigma with a mean of 12.58 and 12.09 out of 30, respectively. And you can see the top responses in italicized um, uh, font here um, for your um, interpretation. You can see internalized stigma had the lowest mean score of 8.62, and the highest score to item was that having used cannabis may make them feel like they're a bad person. And again, the score for that was really low. The highest score to item was, again, that healthcare workers will treat them differently. That was a chief concern for these patients. At the top of the slide, you'll see the mean total stigma score for all four categories is 48.09 out of a possible 120. Now, total stigma was also determined to be a statistically significant predictor for patients not talking about their cannabis use history with their healthcare provider. We know now that universal screening is officially recommended um, by national guidelines as of this year but patients are the ones most commonly initiating that discussion. So we have to do better as healthcare providers. And one of the areas that we can work to meet that uh, need is by driving comfortability with our patients, just establishing rapport, uh, being empathy driven in our approach to assessment and evaluation of our patients has a great potential for impact. But we know providers lack knowledge about cannabis and the endocannabinoid system, the tools and the resources to meet that need. So how can we help? Well, I've been privileged to work um, with a doctoral candidate at Northeastern University, uh, Ms. Nadia Slotke, as well as uh, an associate professor, Dr. Lynn Reed uh, at Northeastern University as well in Boston, working to develop the Cannabis Use Behavior Assessment Tool or uh, QBAT. And to our knowledge, it is the first ever um, validated uh, cannabis assessment tool for use in the preoperative setting. It consists of seven questions that were derived using a modified Delphi method, achieving expert consensus. The questions in the tool are asking directly about cannabis products, not do you smoke, not do you use drugs, but specifically leading with a direct conversation about cannabis. Knowing the primary ways that a patient uses cannabis is important to inform the anesthesia plan of care. Again, the inhalational route is gonna have direct airway um, implications for us. How often do you use and when was the last time you used will also inform the anesthetic plan of care. Knowing the concentrations or contents, acknowledging that there are different mechanisms of action between CBD and THC primarily is important to assess as well as knowing the reasons that they use and acknowledging that patients are not just using cannabis for recreational purposes. They're using it for medicinal purposes that is, if we ask them to abstain in the perioperative period may actually worsen or recur. And for that reason, it's also important to know if the patients have ever had a bad reaction or withdrawn from cannabis. 
So we're pursuing official publication. We're pursuing official publication of this tool, but here it is for your reference. Uh, and hopefully we'll have an official format for dissemination of this tool in the future. And thank you again to Nadia Slatke and Dr. Len Reed for your collaboration uh, in this important project and really Nadia uh, and being a principal investigator in this uh, important project. There are some important uh, practice considerations in our association, our National Association of Nurse Anesthesiology. Uh, and this is currently housed in our substance use disorder document that I'll share with you uh, later as well. But all patients deserve a comprehensive pre-anesthesia assessment and all patients should be evaluated, including types of substances that they're using, the last time that they used, any known triggers for use, a length of an abstinence period, if any, a pattern of use that uh, establishes the dose, frequency, route, and length of use, the current level of uh, pain and uh, uh, analgesia experience as well. And once this information is confirmed, then we can examine the effects on the cardiovascular and respiratory systems and evaluate that as well. And we, as anesthesia providers, can also knowledgeably determine a need for any advanced cardiac or pulmonary testing based on the reported symptoms and any underlying pathology. Now, this is not just for cannabis, but it is really for all substances that patients could be using. In our screening practices, what I described previously is actually better than obtaining a urine or serum drug test. So I'm commonly asked, should we be testing for this in the preoperative period? And the answer is frankly, no. These test results are not useful, nor are they recommended. We know that they only detect THC or carboxy THC, and a positive test result alone does not correlate with poor outcomes. We're also not able to detect an acute level of intoxication with pre-op urine or serum drug testing. And so this is not something that will alter the immediate anesthetic plan. We know that, uh, um, THC is highly lipid soluble, um, it is highly protein bound, uh, and so the elimination time is pretty long. So patients can test positive for a while, and this is not gonna make a distinctive difference in terms of determining surgical risk, nor should it prohibit a patient's ability to sign informed consent. So we simply can't justify or substantiate the time and cost to generate a useful test result. In the realm of informed consent, uh, can a patient provide informed consent if they use cannabis or test positive for cannabis? This is another question that I also get uh, frequently. And I like this quote from the Ameri American Surgical Association because they make it quite simple. If a patient appears intoxicated and incompetent or unable to sign consent, then he, she, or they are unable, right? So um, we should be performing a neurocognitive assessment in all our patients, regardless of whether or not they use cannabis. And we have a legal responsibility to also inform um, risks. So what you should be doing is do discuss the cannabis-related considerations and inform perioperative risks. So let's put this to the test. Presume that your patient just smoked a joint before shoulder arthroscopy. What should happen next? Should you proceed with the case business as usual, cancel the case, postpone the case until later in the day, or maybe you wanna do something else? Now, if I asked you this question before about January of this year, there were real, no real formal recommendations in place to guide your decision-making. Now through practice guidelines that we have integrated through an article that I recently published uh, in August, and I'm confident that we can probably link, uh, uh, provide a link to this article as well, expert consensus recommendations uh, would be able to, uh, would al allow you to postpone the elective case for any patient demonstrating psychomotor impairment uh, and definitively for at least two hours after smoking. And the cited major concerns for that related to um, the psychomotor impairment are the ability to provide informed consent, right, legally, but also in the smoking realm, a cardiovascular risk for myocardial injury. 
Of course, no guideline is out there to replace clinical judgment for individualized patient care, so let's factor in some of that as well. So in making the determination about an abstinence period, we have to be very cognizant that our patients may not only be using cannabis for recreational purposes, which is often assumed uh, by uh, providers, but also to treat conditions that if we ask them to abstain from their cannabis may reemerge in the postoperative period. Those chronic pain conditions, those seizure disorders or others. Our latest consensus guidelines will recommend delaying elective cases for altered mental status or impaired decision-making capacity, and again, for smoking less than two hours prior. From an anesthetic perspective, our concern with the smoking route is its obvious correlation to airway complications, and that has always been true whether it is cannabis or whether it is from tobacco products or whether it is from va vaping, right? We know our current evidence-based recommendations are to delay elective cases for these reasons, but that is due to elevated myocardial risk that uh, you see statistically is correlated here. And so our advice has always been to uh, abstain from uh, cannabis for at least two hours from the smoking route or you risk um, cessation or you risk cancel cancellation if you're not uh, uh, imbibed in a period of cessation, right? But you're gonna see a lot of variability in recommendations. General advice is to abstain for 24 to 72 hours from smoking to decrease airway reactivity, improve wound healing, uh, but ideally for as long as possible. For as long as you can abstain from that smoking route, uh, the greater you're going to um, uh, have the greater wound healing experience you're going to have, um, the less cardio, or the less uh, cardiovascular risk you're going to have, the less airway irrit irritability um, you're going to experience as well. And so, for this reason, uh, it's possible that patients could be seeking an alternative route besides smoking, which may also coincide conveniently with NPO status prior to surgery. What about tapering dose uh, before surgery? Um, the problem with this is that the safety data are lacking. Um, abrupt cessation is definitively discouraged for chronic conditions, and you're going to see, again, some variability between recommendations here. Now, the perioperative pain and addiction interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary network or pain consensus recommendations that came out in 2021 will recommend consideration, and I emphasize considering, weaning high-dose users greater than seven days preoperatively. Now, they recommend against attempting to wean uh, within that seven-day window preoperatively. How do they define a high-dose user? And they define it as greater than 1.5 grams per day smoked, greater than 300 milligrams per day of CBD oil, or greater than 20 milligrams per day of THC, or some unknown dose, more than two to three times per day. Now, again, these are in isolated categories. So they're, what do you do if a patient uh, uh, has some in one category and some in the other? It's, it's uh, not entirely clear. Uh, and they also recommend not substituting without expert guidance. So this is where the care of a, of a cannabis expert and cannabis nurses can really have a, a great influence and impact on the perioperative plan of care. As we're informing the patient about the risks and benefits of anesthesia, we often encounter questions about whether they can or should continue using it when they go home. Now, if you're looking for a research project, here's a great big window of opportunity because here's some of the advice that we're giving our patients as part of mainstream preoperative education for resuming cannabis after surgery. Our patients are typically advised to not resume use after surgery until the effects of their anesthetic and pain medications have completely worn off. Mixing cannabis products with opioids or alcohol has presented concerns in the medical community for causing decreased reflexes and increased sedation levels. 
it may compromise memory and cognitive function more than if any one substance is taken alone. And there is also concern within the medical community as well about the development of different use disorders. However, when we get to its impact on post-operative pain, as we will hear shortly, I'll give you some insights on why I think this needs to be challenged uh, with further stad study and uh, validation of uh, good data. So we use our clinical judgment to prepare and remember that our patients are initiating disclosure, but they're reluctant to do so. We should have consideration for the last time that they use their cannabis and, and the route to determine onset and duration, acknowledging that there's different bioavailability and duration of action, depending on whether it's inhaled or whether it's ingested. We should also evaluate every body system. We should establish a risk profile from a cardiac standpoint. Perhaps we wanna obtain an electrocardiogram uh, depending on what we find but also evaluating uh, blood pressure to know that um, uh, different products and different concentrations can influence hemodynamics in different capacities. Synthetic can cannabinoids also have effects on vitamin K dependent factors. And so uh, evaluating coagulation status is really important as well. We're concerned our, about our patients having increased bleeding because of the role of vitamin K um, and, and patients taking synthetic cannabinoids. From a respiratory standpoint, depends on the underlying tone for the patient. There are increases in lung volumes in patients who smoke cannabis in terms of total lung capacity, uh, uh, FRC and residual volumes. We get mixed results in the forced expiratory volume in one second if we look at a, a pulmonary function test or PFT. So we see some patients will have reduced FEV1, FVC ratios due to increased uh, FVC. And other studies show reduced FEV1 that's really consistent with airflow obstruction, similar as to what you would see for a patient who has COPD. Neurologically, we know that THC dose and deter uh, timing is going to determine psychosis risk, but we should also be assessing for a seizure history. We certainly don't want a relapse of a seizure disorder to occur while the patient's under an anesthetic or while they're in the immediate or continuing postoperative phase. And pain, we got to get ahead of it. And I'm going to talk to you specifically about that at the end of this presentation. So moving out of the preoperative into the interoperative period, it's time for surgery. And we're gonna discuss the pharmacology here because we're definitely in the business of uh, upregulation and downregulation of different receptors interacting with many, of re uh, uh, many different um, receptors. Now, cannabis has effects virtually everywhere and so do our anesthetic agents. All of the receptors that you can see here, and this slide is intentionally overwhelming to show you just how vast and far the reach is of cannabis drugs on different receptors, as well as anesthetic agents on GABA receptors, glutaminergic, opiate, dopaminergic, serotonin, cholinergic, you name it, even the glucocorticoid axis as it has a uh, pertinent role in the surgical stress response. Now, luckily for us in anesthesia, cannabinoid receptors are absent in the cardiorespiratory brainstem centers, so it's virtually impossible to overdose on cannabis. So we don't have similar concerns with that as we would have with other substances. As a brief review of uh, what a lot of you who are tuning in are already intimately familiar with are the pharmacokinetics of cannabis. And we're very familiar in anesthesia with the inhalational route, which has a peak onset within about 15 minutes, duration of action of a couple of hours, depending on the source that you look at. However, what we often take for granted is that oral or transdermal routes are less predictable in their onset and they occur in longer time intervals. So it's not uncommon that a product consumed in the preoperative period may go unknown to the provider, peak during the interoperative period while that patient's under an anesthetic, and then the provider may become perplexed with otherwise unexplained changes in hemodynamics. Of course, half-life and elimination are prolonged due to the lipophilicity and protein binding, respectively. Now, understanding the pharmacokinetics is essential for understanding anesthetic drug interactions, which are occurring largely due to enzymatic influences in the liver, 
and specifically the mixed function oxidase family of the CYP450 cytochrome P450 enzymes. Now, these enzymes are going to catalyze and speed up chemical reactions. They will introduce an oxygen atom into substrate molecules, whether that is from cannabis or an anesthetic drug. And that often results in a dealkylated and hydroxylated metabolite through a process called oxidation. Now, all of this is meant to detoxify the body and promote metabolism. There are at least about 50 different isoenzymes or subtypes that can further be inhibited or induced or otherwise influenced by exposure to various drugs, but they're also genetic influences. And so there's a lot of individual patient variability. Common pathways for metabolism and theoretical mechanisms for cross tolerance are highlighted in yellow. And so look, it's through that CYP450 pathway. As you can see, THC is metabolized primarily by enzymes in the liver called cytochrome P450. You see subtypes here, 2C9, 3A4, and 2C19. Now propofol, a, a main anesthetic agent, shares a common pathway here. It shares a common pathway with cytochrome P450, 2C9. Now, other drugs we utilize in the perioperative period, like fentanyl, oxycodone, and codeine, share common metabolic pathways through 453A4. And so don't Celebrex, NSAIDs, Coumadin, and even in Plavix have shared pathways as well with 2C9. And what I hope you understand is that when we place a shared demand on these enzymes, Upregulation or increased production of these enzymes as the body's natural adaptive response can lead to faster metabolism. And so it's logical thought that a patient who uses products high in THC may have increased anesthetic agent requirements when they undergo uh, an anesthetic. And of course, no patient wants to be uh, at risk to be awake or have awareness or recall uh, during an anesthetic period. There's mixed clinical evidence for this cross tolerance though, between cannabis and our anesthetic agents, specifically propofol. And the obvious concern is for sub-anesthetic dosing, but also potentially airway reactivity that tends to occur in a lighter plane of anesthesia. There are many generalized case reports uh, out there in the literature of increased anesthetic requirements. Anesthesia clinicians will often label these cases as being propofol sinks Seemingly, you can dump and dump propofol into these patients, and you're not getting them asleep in the same way that in the same way that you would a routine patient. Flisberg et al. sought to study this in 2009. They looked at a, a small population of male patients, and what they found is there were about 50 milligrams more propofol doses required in order to facilitate laryngeal mask airway insertion or sub, uh, supraglottic airway. Uh, device for, uh, for patients. Tordowski et al. Uh, also studied this in 2019, and what they found was a cited 225% per, uh, percent more propofol requirement in patients for endoscopy. However, I think it's important to note from the study that propofol here was not believed to be the primary anesthetic agent. Uh, and there was a relatively, in my opinion, clinically insignificant difference of 14 versus 45 milligrams of propofol that quantifies to 220%, but this also occurred after an average of 79 milligrams of Versed and 100 to 125 micrograms of fentanyl had already been administered to the patient. In the study of mine that I mentioned to you earlier from 2021, I looked at 635 patients and found no statistically significant difference in propofol requirements for EGD, uh, but there were certainly limitations in the study as the procedures were of short duration and it was a procedure of a single type. So enzyme induction uh, it leads to this interpretation that patients who use cannabis may require uh, higher uh, doses of anesthetic agents, but enzyme inhibition is also of concern. So when we look at uh, enzymes that can be inhibited by THC or CBD 
Some are listed here. And again, you see CBD is a potent inhibitor of propofol through TC9, uh, 2C9, but also other drugs like warfarin, uh, morphine. And yes, patients can get super therapeutic on their drugs as well as have increased requirements because of these reasons. Generally summarizing anesthesia drug implications here, what you see is that uh, in patients who are, have acute use of cannabis, there can be an additive pharmacodynamic action uh, when combined with drugs that produce similar effects. So with acute use, uh, our CNS depressant drugs may have more depressing effects. Our sympathomimetic drugs, so things like ketamine, but of course, epinephrine, ephedrine, other drugs that we're utilizing, we can have pronounced tachycardia in the interoperative period. Our non-depolarizing muscle relaxants may be potentiated, and there have been profound responses to inhaled anesthetics that have been described in the literature. We may experience augmentation of drugs that cause respiratory or cardiac depression as well. Now let's get into the physiology of this uh, by body system. So starting with the gut, uh, the gastrointestinal implications of cannabis use uh, on an anesthetic for a patient uh, has some considerations here. So we're concerned that patients who smoke cannabis may uh, have nicotinic stomatitis or gingival enlargement. And what that correlates for us uh, too is bleeding or potentially edema with oropharyngeal or airway manipulation. Patients who use cannabis also have reduced gastric acid secretion, decreased motility and delayed gastric emptying. The gut has extensive regulation by the CB1 receptor. And so when cannabinoids bind here, they're going to inhibit neurotransmitter release. Now, the neurotransmitter in this case is acetylcholine. And when acetylcholine gets inhibited, there's slowing of colonic propulsion and peristalsis. And that can ultimately delay gastric emptying on average by about 30 minutes to two hours more than normal. And so that confers an aspiration risk for our patients. And it warrants a prophylactic regimen. Perhaps we can give them things like Pepsid or Bicitra preoperatively, or in the operating room, we might do a rapid sequence of intubation to protect the airway for that patient. Although it's used by some for its anti-emetic properties, we know that um, cannabis has not been demonstrated to be effective paradoxically uh, in the prevention of post-operative nausea and vomiting specifically and in fact, patients who use cannabis have worsening of risk for postoperative nausea and vomiting, as demonstrated in the literature. And again, we don't have a strong handle on knowing why, but we know that overuse and or abrupt withdrawal of cannabis has also been associated with a hyperemesis syndrome, an often overlooked condition potentially in the GI suite for a patient who use cannabis but present with a recent history of nausea and vomiting, and maybe they're getting an EGD for part of their workup. The cardiovascular effects are going to be dose dependent and the response that occurs we know typically exists in a biphasic form. What you'll find is that anesthesia providers do not like tachycardia and the reason that we don't like it is because in a period of surgical stress the patient is already vulnerable and now we're increasing metabolic demand and cardiac workload in a very vulnerable time period for a patient. Uh, when those must be preserved really to deal with the surgical insult that's simultaneously occurring. We also prefer normal sinus rhythm, go figure, and the cited dysrhythmias that can occur are concerning to us as well, especially things like atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter in our patient population reliant on that atrial kick to reach a preferred cardiac output or even to mitigate the risk of thrombus in an already elevated risk period of surgery. Now, we also know that some cannabis products will increase circulating catecholamine levels that could lead to a myocardial event, more so when exposed to compounding surgical stress and a period of increased myocardial demand. So there's a principal triad that occurs with smoking, and it results in uh, increased carboxyhemoglobin levels, which leads to decreased oxygen carrying capacity of hemoglobin, decreased oxygen supply in the setting of increased myocardial oxygen demand, 
and the induction of platelet aggregation. And this resembles somewhat of consumptive type of coagulopathy. Now the increased incidence of myocardial infarction seems to be worsened by increasing doses of available THC and within that first 60 minutes after use. So in our vulnerable patient population, our consensus guidelines are now to delay elective procedures for at least two hours as the risk of death from MI has also been demonstrated to increase during that time period in the literature by two and a half to four times. From the perspective of an anesthesia provider who's charged with the management of our respiratory mechanics with advanced airway interventions, much of what we observe in the tobacco smoking patient also occurs in our population that smokes or vapes cannabis. Though we're also concerned about the higher burning temperatures of a, a cannabis joint versus a tobacco cigarette. There's also difference in breath holding techniques that can lead to patterns of coughing or wheezing in these patients. Now bronchospasm is an adverse event that can occur, especially during the induction or the emergence from anesthesia or stimulating periods of surgery. And it can necessitate advanced interventions like administering bronchodilatory agents, deepening the anesthetic, epinephrine administration in severe cases, and others. We're also notably concerned about the development of airway edema and bullous lung disease with long-term use, and that can predispose the patient to things like pneumothorax if we're putting them on positive pressure ventilation during a general anesthetic. Let's get to our post-operative period and talk about getting our patients out of the operating room safely. There are some individualized case reports that illustrate some concern for us as anesthesia providers. There are some that uh, demonstrate cases of uvular edema or swelling. There have been multiple case reports of this in the literature, and it typically occurs within four to 12 hours of inhaled large quantities of smoke. So again, a reason to avoid the smoking route immediately prior to surgery or in a recent period prior to surgery. There's increased susceptibility with manipulation of tissues with intubation or any sort of airway uh, maneuver, and airway obstruction uh, can lead to the need for definitive management. Should it occur in the postoperative period, our obvious concern is for partial or total airway obstruction in which we have to emergently reintubate the patient. And it, because the airway is already irritable, we then get worried about things like bronchospasm, uh, things that can be mitigated with something like methylprednisone or salbutamol, but the treatment of uvular edema uh, includes steroids. So you can give uh, um, uh, an initial 10 milligram dose of dexamethasone and then 0.1 milligram per kilogram every six to 12 hours for one to two days postoperatively. Some who have encountered this may uh, present a concern that you should uh, also be delaying procedures, but it can happen with anyone. Cigarette smokers, vapors, uh, we have to remain vigilant here. There are also concerns in the literature about diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. Usually this is found about 30 to 45 minutes into the recovery period in cases like you can see here. And in this phenomenon, there's existing damage to the alveolar epithelial lining and increased alveolo uh, uh, capillary membrane permeability. So this tends to manifest in a rapid onset of dyspnea or shortness of breath, hemoptysis or coughing up blood and acute respiratory failure. If negative pressure pulmonary edema occurs, it can actually be rendered hemorrhagic in these patients because of the effects of cannabis use. The treatment is supportive measures, things like bronchoalveolar lavage and consideration of something like a prednisone taper. Unfortunately, this condition is, uh, can be and it has been fatal, though it is pretty isolated in the literature. A final consideration that I've been personally asked about by patients and probably some of you who are tuning in have as well is whether or not they can use cannabis as a pain treatment modality, especially after surgery when you're anticipating that you're gonna have some pain. 
when we look to the literature to guide us and back us up in our informing of our patients, it's really problematic because patients who frequently use cannabis, especially those with higher THC, tend to actually have higher pain scores and require more opioids in that immediate acute post-operative period when compared to patients who don't use cannabis. It is by as much as twofold for reasons that aren't entirely understood. One of our leading theories is perhaps uh, hyperalgesia that is dose dependent and mediated through the TRPV1 or TRPV1 receptor. Cannabis patients also tend to have worse sleep quality after surgery. And we know that sleep is really important for healing. Those patients who don't have good sleep patterns tend to have higher pain scores and chronic use is thought to decrease the pain threshold. However, they also have less outpatient use of, uh, of opioids and they're much less likely to be persistent opioid users than those who don't use cannabis. Now, if you ask me why, and perhaps you can infer this, I'm going to tell you that I'm quite confident it's because as soon as they get out of the hospital and they're able to, they're back to their regularly programmed cannabis schedule. So again, here's our window of opportunity to derive some hard safety data surrounding this because it's a definitive patient safety and well-being need that we need to be well established. When we look at resuming or administering cannabinoids in the acute pain setting, the studies have been inconclusive so far, at least on our end, in being established as an effective therapy for postoperative pain. So although cannabis has been demonstrated as an effective analgesic agent in a chronic pain setting, we can't currently officially recommend them as a perioperative acute pain treatment with enough sufficient evidence. So again, Let's drum up some evidence uh, and, and find a definitive solution on this. Because I truly believe in my lifetime, we're gonna get there, probably with the help of cannabis clinicians and cannabis experts and cannabis scientists. And we're gonna have the ability to administer a synthetic cannabinoid receptor agonist as anesthesia providers, as part of a multimodal pain regimen. And until then, we have to make sure our interventions are multimodal that they heavily involve peripheral or central nerve blockade with local anesthetics. And we need to get our patients uh, on our acute pain service early with referral to make sure that they have vigilant monitoring and treatment of their pain after surgery, just like every patient deserves. Cannabis withdrawal syndrome is a concern in the post-operative period, and it can't be monitored for if we're not identifying cannabis use in the preoperative period. The risk is greatest with high or unknown THC concentrations, uh, and it can be anticipated during hospitalization, especially after a long-term or high-dose exposure to THC, followed by abrupt cessation or having that taken away. We monitor it postoperatively with a validated cannabis withdrawal scale, although I'll tell you that's not routinely incorporated in the postoperative period and probably should. Uh, and patients should also be educated about the symptoms listed in the scoring system uh, uh, from DSM-5 criteria. Proposed treatments uh, show some promise uh, with the treatment methods that have been demonstrated here, but none are truly proven effective for use. I believe that dronabinol shows good promise and is recommended uh, by recent anesthesia consensus guidelines, but again, not every hospital has this on formulary. Let's summarize and give you some best practice considerations uh, that you can watch this later and pause and refer back to uh, because the slides are a little dense, but I wanna make sure that we're pulling forward the best evidence for you to carry into your practice. The first is a subsection within the practice guidelines from the American Association of Nurse Anesthesiology for Cannabis. Um, now, they discuss physiological implications and considerations, and I'm proud to say that through chairing this committee, we have just recently, as, as recent as the past month, updated this document and had it approved by the Board of Directors in August. The updates include, importantly, getting the right language into this document and getting the potential stigmatization out of it. So that means utilizing the appropriate medical term of cannabis instead of marijuana, and also importantly, differentiating use disorder uh, from just use 
and then monitoring for withdrawal in uh, the post-operative period. There are many other considerations here for you to refer back to with a link included below, but we talked about a lot of these uh, physiological highlights, uh, possible potentiation of commonly used drugs, such as sympathomimetics, and practice considerations, of course, including airway vigilance, but also cueing considerations for pro prophylactic treatments with dexamethasone, the possible need to increase propofol dosing, and to avoid drugs that exacerbate potential myocardial risk with recent or acute use. Finally, I want to point out that it's been it's been five years since the National Council of State Boards of Nursing, or NCSBN, published a supplement to the Journal of Nursing Regulation that contains national nursing guidelines. Now, they have principles for pre-licensure and advanced practice nurses uh, uh, and educators. And we have a responsibility to be educating our future clinicians in all nursing programs on um, the current state of legislation, medical marijuana programs, the endocannabinoid receptors uh, and the system and all of its in intricacies, pharmacology, withdrawal syndrome, safety considerations, uh, and even ethical considerations and employer policies acknowledging that not only are patients using it, but clinicians are using it too. So how do you address that? We know that the education is important. We know that knowledge is extremely powerful and reducing stigma. So I can't thank you enough for tuning in today to hopefully increase some of your knowledge. I can take some questions here and I'm gonna display the reference page here for you as well so that you can potentially pause this and refer back to the sources that were utilized in preparing this presentation. Uh Great job. Yeah, thank you so much, Daniel. What what a wealth of information you are. And I bet the, the Chicago systems are, are loving you and, and saying, what, what do we do with these folks using cannabinoids? Yeah. So what, when, when somebody is using CBD oil, like what, what this is the, the most popular thing, especially with some of our older patients, right? They're not using THC. They've got the 0.3% in their, their hemp CBD oils. Um, if, if somebody is taking maybe 100 milligrams a day of that, do they need to have any concerns and, and, and do they need to stop? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, we don't have any definitive guidance on that yet. And the reason is because um, we haven't differentiated it in our studies. So we tend to just say, oh, the patient uses cannabis. We don't say that they use THC or that they use CBD predominantly. And so we need to get good at stratifying that, the dose, the route, um, all of that in our uh, studies uh, in order to derive a good decision. We're also not so sure. We know that CBD is metabolized by those sub enzymes that I mentioned, 3A4. Um, and 2C19. So although it doesn't share the same common pathway as of propofol metabolism, it does share common pathways for ketamine, fentanyl, and midazolam. So again, being able to individualize and stratify and you know parse these out and not put them all in one category and say everything anesthesia, but to really break, break it down, propofol, ketamine, fentanyl, et cetera, and not to just say everything cannabis, but THC, CBD, flavonoids, terpenoids, et cetera, is really, really important. Um, and we need a greater capacity to study that uh, in our research. Yeah, it, it does sound like the three to seven day window is, is, is wise uh, to, to take. Um, yeah, and, and the other thing is just, you know, in, in the, in the post-operative period of, I can't wait till we start saying, okay, a couple of days after really fold in that one-to-one -one CBD THC oil and then minimize that opiate use because that there's a window of time. We want three to five days tops where people are using opiates and then, and then to have those uh, uh, gone. Right. Uh, and, and using, you know, a CBD, CBDA, even uh, as a COX-2 inhibitor uh, it, together with Motrin or minimizing that even uh, these are the dialogues that we need to go forward to really be conscious and, and help people uh, stratify what these risks benefits are and really what the path is to, to natural healing. Totally. And I'm, also, and I'm also very interested too in those patients that do have to elect to surgery to be inpatient in the hospital that they have replaced all of their pharmaceuticals using cannabis as medicine. What do we do for those patients? Mm. So here they are, right? So here they are 
on a regimen that works for them. They've managed, they've come off their pharmaceuticals. Now they have to have a surgical procedure. Now they have to be admitted. Now they have to be under the care of the hospital and those medicines, and they don't have access or the ability to use what they normally used to help them. Yeah. Right. That, that's, that's where my interest lies in those chronic patients that have. Yeah, like, Cause a three to five, seven day wean is going to be something well, unacceptable. And then also being hospitalized yeah. for yeah. that long. And you right. know that once you start, you know, you stop taking cannabis, your body is going to respond. It mm -hmm. gets nervous. It starts to create more receptors actually looking for those molecules yeah. and the hospitalized patients, then the benzodiazepines, the opiates, and, 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 and sometimes antipsychotics if somebody is agitated, it, it's, it's crazy. And so it, we need clinicians to know both sides of this treatment plan. And also how, how can yeah. we, you know, utilize other nutraceuticals yeah. even. And, and other, other modalities to upregulate the endocannabinoid system, deep breathing, and maybe some acupuncture. And I don't know if they're doing that inpatient, but other ways to, to chill out that patient. <laughs> other ways to modulate the endocannabinoid system without using cannabis, yeah. right? Because we know that everything that we do or don't do as patients and everything that we tell our patients to do or don't do affects the endocannabinoid system. So if they don't have access to cannabis, what are other things that we can provide for them, right? Yeah, I agree. And I, you know, right now we're just dreaming of these things. Yeah. And Elizabeth, you were the one who said, I have a dream recently. And mm -hmm. I, can say, I, I can hear the passion and I feel you, I get it. Um, in the midst of an opioid crisis of all times, um, to just be reliant on our conventional uh, opioid treatment regimens. But the great thing is that certified registered nurse anesthetists are so skilled at um, opioid sparing and opioid free anesthetics um, and providing a, you know, peripheral nerve blockade um, and to provide um, other agents like Presidex and ketamine and lidocaine infusions and magnesium and to really take a holistic approach to care of the patient that defies our conventional logic and the way that we've treated patients in this healthcare system. We know that we have a lot of work to do and so that's why I'm so thankful for the efforts um, of Holistic Caring and Green Nurse to try to move that forward. Wow. Thank you. Thank I'm so you. grateful for you. And we have a free network for the, for the <laughs> viewers, for all of you viewers that are out there that are new, that are using cannabis, that are new to cannabis, that are interested in cannabis, that are cannabis curious. Elizabeth has built an absolutely amazing, beautiful network, network.holisticcaring.com. It is free to all people, all providers, all patients, and you can come in. It's run by nurses and our pharmacist, Charmaine, and we have a free introductory to cannabis course in there that Elizabeth has created. All of our webcasts, podcasts, clinical conversations, articles, research, support is all available. And all of our professional programs have just been updated. So we've got some fresh content in there. So uh, we also have a sale. So School 40, uh, this month for back to school, you can save 40% on all programs. And if you want your free seven page medical guide, just go to the website, sign up for the newsletter, and you will get a free seven page medical cannabis guide. Daniel, this has been absolutely amazing. You've done an amazing job presenting. Thank you so much for being our guest lecturer this month. We look forward to having you back and we're going to be following you closely on all of the things that you're doing for cannabis patients, for patients in general. Right? Patients and professionals. Patients and professionals in general, yeah. really, truly, because this is, we are in revolutionary times where we are changing the dialogue around how we take care of patients, right? The future of healthcare is patient empowerment. And the only way that we can do that as clinicians is to get to know our patients. Education, guidance, and support. And so here we are. We're dreamers, but we're also paving the road. Paving the road. <laughs> and so remember everyone what it's all about. It's truly about living your best life and helping others do the same. If you want to get in touch with Dr. Daniel King, his information is below in all of the notes. So you will be able to reach out to him directly. I know that if I ever needed anesthesia, Daniel, I will be following, I will be finding you. I will literally, I will. <laughs> We're not getting any surgeries. We're not getting any surgeries. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But this is a wrap. This has been an amazing podcast. Thank you all for joining us. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us at info at holisticcaring.com. Visit the website, join the network. We love you all. Live your best life and help others do the same. There we go. I'm going to end with my favorite video.
We're here to educate and empower patients to make choices that are best for them. We're also here to decrease stigma around what it means to feel good and be high. Hence the H for hope, I for inspiration, G for growth, and H for healing. The Green Nurse is a holistic cannabis nurse that teaches on the endocannabinoid system and the safe utilization of cannabis and other progressive tools to help people reach a better quality of life. I was cannabis agnostic for many, many years. And you know, the more research I did, the more I discovered the cannabis is this amazing medicine. I was told that I had a four stage pancreatic cancer. The doctor really told me he couldn't do anything else. He gave me her name and she called me and she came to my house. She started to give me cannabis. My oncologist was puzzled because he couldn't find the cancer anymore. All of the learning that we get yeah. comes from the Green Nurses Group, comes from their support, comes from their guidance. I trust everything that she says. Simply meet people where they're at. The plant doesn't, you know, stress to grow, so we don't stress to share it. We're healing people. Cannabis has been used as a medicine for tens upon thousands of years. Here's the big message. Cannabis needs to be federally legal. We need to have laws that are the same across all 50 states that allow access to anyone and everyone who wants to utilize this powerful medicine.